Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani, and during this lesson, we will start our unit on pathogens and diseases, a unit that deals with situations that are unfortunately too familiar to us. Even before COVID-19, if someone were to cough or sneeze around you, you would most likely move away from them. And you did this because you don't want to catch their germs or get whatever disease they have. So what are germs? Well, germs are often microbes, organisms that can only be seen using a microscope. The world and our bodies are full of microorganisms, and most of them are harmless or even beneficial. But when microbes or other organisms cause disease, we call them pathogens. There are different types of pathogens. Some are living organisms made up of one or more cells, and some are not made of cells at all, and are therefore categorized by scientists as non-living. During the course of this lesson, we will explore briefly the different types of pathogens and some of the diseases that they cause. It is important to note, though, that not all microorganisms are pathogenic. Most bacteria and fungi, for example, are extremely beneficial to the world's ecosystems and even to our own health. Now, before we begin our exploration of the different types of pathogens, let me warn you that I will be giving examples of some common diseases caused by pathogens. So please be aware that some of the descriptions and some of the images may not necessarily be pleasant. So having said that, let's start with parasites. Parasites are organisms that live on or in an organism of another species. We call this other organism the host. The parasite lives by obtaining nutrients from the host, and as it does, it tends to harm or sometimes even kill the host. Some parasites, like species of protozoa, are microscopic pathogens, and I will teach you about them in a minute. But for now, I want to talk about macroparasites, which are animals that are small, but not necessarily microscopic. Macroparasites include ectoparasites, those tiny little insects that live outside the host on our skin or in our hair, like these different species of lice that we see here. But it also includes the many species of worm parasites, like this Ascaris or this tapeworm. Worm parasites are usually roundworms and flatworms that live inside the body of the host. Many are transmitted through contaminated soil and make their home in the intestines of mammals. For example, the human hookworm. Human hookworms are nematodes that live in warm and tropical climates throughout the world. I'm pretty sure that they're called hookworms because of the teeth-like structures at the openings of their mouth. An estimated 700 million people worldwide are suffering from a hookworm infection, and they get infected mostly by walking barefoot in contaminated soil. The way they infect humans is like this. The tiny hookworm larvae live in the soil, and they will actually penetrate the skin, usually through the feet when people walk barefoot. Then they enter the bloodstream and move through the host's body until they get to the lungs. There, they exit the circulatory system into the lungs, where they migrate up to the trachea. Then, when the host coughs them up and then swallows them, they make it down through the digestive tract into the intestines. There, the larvae mature, mate, and bite into the lining of the intestines where they settle for a long time, like sometimes years. They drink the blood of the host. They cause anemia as a result of that. They can also cause protein deficiencies, bloating, and fatigue. And while in the intestines, the females release thousands of eggs every day, which are then pooped out by the host. And when living conditions are poor, or if there's a complete lack of sanitation, that can start the cycle again if the poop makes its way into the soil. So many pathogens are spread and transmitted when soil, food, or water are contaminated by human or animal feces. For example, many species of pathogenic protozoa are spread through contaminated water. Protozoa are a group of single-celled eukaryotes that feed on other organisms. They can be parasitic, like the Plasmodium protus that lives in red blood cells and is the cause of malaria, and is transmitted, as you probably know, by mosquitoes. But they are mostly found in contaminated water, like this Giardia. A Giardia infection is an intestinal infection that causes stomach cramps, bloating, nausea, and bouts of watery diarrhea. 
Giardia are very common in streams and lakes, but can also be found in swimming pools, whirlpools, spas, wells, and poorly sanitized tap water. Giardia infections can also be spread through food and utensils that have been washed with infected water. Infections by Giardia are one of the reasons why we are told to not drink tap water or to be careful with the water that we are consuming when we travel outside Canada. Another waterborne protozoa I want to tell you about is a species of amoeba called Nagleria fowleri, commonly known as a brain-eating amoeba because, well, that's pretty much what it does. Nagleria fowleri is an amoeba that lives mostly in warm, fresh water. People get infected by this amoeba when water forcibly goes up someone's nose mostly when diving or swimming in warm bodies of water like lakes and rivers. Once inside the nose, the amoeba travels to the brain, where it starts to eat and destroy brain tissue. Now, I know that an amoeba that will eat your brain sounds scary, but I have some good news and some bad news about this protozoan. The good news is that cases of infections from this amoeba are extremely rare. For example, in the U.S. in the past 10 years, the CDC has recorded just 34 cases of infections by this amoeba. That's less than four cases a year. The bad news is that it is extremely deadly. The fatality rate is over 97%. Basically, only four people out of 148 known infected individuals in the United States from like 1962 to 2019 have ever survived an infection by a brain-eating amoeba. So brain-eating amoebas are pretty rare, but extremely dangerous. So let's talk then about a different type of pathogen, one that may be more common, but is definitely a lot less deadly. And that is fungi. And although there are thousands of species of fungi, only a few of them actually cause human disease. Usually they are the cause of minor skin conditions, and rarely are they the cause of life-threatening diseases. A very common fungal skin condition is athlete's foot or tinea pedis, which is caused by a mold. Another common fungal infection is a yeast infection. Yeast infections, which are also called thrush, are caused by a species of yeast that is found in our bodies called candida. Candida can grow in your mouth, throat, and other parts of your body. Unlike molds, which are multicellular organisms, yeast are unicellular fungi. Most fungal infections cause redness, itchiness, and irritation. And they are very often contagious and can pass from person to person through either direct contact or, less commonly, through contact with common surfaces. Like, for example, the fungus that causes athlete's foot grows best in moist, damp environments. So the fungal spores can survive for a long time, months, or even years in bathrooms, in changing rooms, or around swimming pools. And this is the reason that the infection is called athlete's foot, because athletes tend to spend time in changing rooms or around swimming pools, and they tend to shower in public showers like at the gym more often. Athlete's foot is the reason why you should always wear shower shoes when using a public shower. Fungal infections are often opportunistic infections. This means that fungi, like for example yeast, that live in our bodies at all times, take advantage of times when conditions in our bodies change or when our immune system is lowered in order to grow and cause an infection. So for that reason, fungal infections can be a real problem for people who have an immune system that has been compromised by a disease, like for example, people who are undergoing cancer treatments or who are suffering from AIDS. Now, a fungal infection that you may have heard about is called ringworm, but perhaps you didn't know that it was caused by a fungus, because the name is kind of misleading. So ringworm is not a worm. It is actually a rash that is caused by a mold. Ringworm is usually a group of skin infections called tinea. They are named differently depending on where in the body they happen. For example, athlete's foot is actually a type of ringworm that occurs on the foot. Tinea infections are also the cause of nail fungus or jock itch. When people think of ringworm, they're actually usually thinking of tinea corporis, which is what we call the infection when it happens in the skin of our legs, our torso, or our arms. This type of ringworm infection can spread through contact with infected animals, often pets or domesticated animals like horses. It can also be spread by contact with other people who are infected, or by sharing items that have come in contact with the fungus. Most fungal infections are typically treated with antifungal creams or gels that are applied directly to an affected area. Antifungal drugs can sometimes also be taken by mouth. 
Another more familiar group of pathogens are bacteria. Bacteria are single cell organisms that, unlike any of the other types of organisms we've discussed so far, are made of a type of cell called a prokaryotic cell. Prokaryotic cells are cells that do not have a nucleus or any other membrane-bound organelles within them. And bacteria are all microscopic. Even the biggest are only 10 micrometers long, which is much, much smaller than our own cells. They are found everywhere in the world and are even found in huge quantities both on and inside our bodies. They say that there are actually way more bacteria cells in our bodies than there are human cells. And that should not be a scary fact because most bacteria are harmless and actually even helpful. But of course there are some that are pathogenic, which is what we're here to discuss. So when pathogenic bacteria find their way into our bodies, they often release toxins that make us feel sick. Examples of bacterial infections are streptococcus bacteria that cause a common throat infection called strep throat, or for example, mycobacterium tuberculosis, which are bacteria that usually attack the lungs, causing a highly infectious disease called tuberculosis, sometimes called TB for short. So for this lesson, I want to teach you a little bit about one particular bacterial disease, one that may not seem so dangerous at first. It is a bacterium called Staphylococcus. This bacteria is very commonly found on the skin or in the nose of even healthy people. And most of the time, these bacteria cause no problems or result in just relatively minor skin infections. But Staphylococcus aureus is the most dangerous of all the common staph bacteria. Staph infections can turn deadly if the bacteria invade deeper into the body, entering our bloodstream, our joints, our bones, our lungs, and even our heart. Boils, impetigo, and cellulitis are three of the most common staph infections. A boil is basically a pocket of pus that usually develops in a hair follicle or in an oil gland, and the skin over the infected area usually becomes red and swollen. Staph can also cause impetigo. This is a contagious, often painful rash that usually features large blisters that may ooze fluid and develop a honey-colored crust. Staph bacteria that infect the deeper layers of the skin can cause cellulitis. Even though the infection is deep in the skin, cellulitis causes redness and swelling on the surface of the skin. The affected skin then appears swollen and red and is typically painful and warm to the touch. Cellulitis usually affects the skin in the lower legs, but it can actually occur in the face, the arms, and other body parts. Staphylococcus bacteria are also one of the most common causes of food poisoning. Symptoms of food poisoning by staph bacteria usually come on quickly, usually within hours of eating a contaminated food, and they disappear quickly too, usually lasting only about half a day. Staphylococcus bacteria are also one of the bacteria that are the cause of toxic shock syndrome. Toxic shock syndrome is a rare but life-threatening condition that is caused by bacteria that gets into the body and releases harmful toxins. It is often associated with tampon use in women, but that's not the only cause of it. It can actually be caused by bacteria getting into the body in several different ways from, say, wounds, and it can affect anyone of any age, including men and children. The symptoms of toxic shock syndrome start suddenly and get worse very quickly. They include a high temperature, flu-like symptoms like a headache or feeling cold or tired, an achy body, vomiting or diarrhea, a widespread sunburn-like rash all over the body, the lips, tongue, and the whites of the eyes can turn bright red. And if it is caused by tampon use, then also there could be redness of the vagina. It also causes low blood pressure, which can lead to dizziness and fainting. Toxic shock syndrome, like I said, gets worse very quickly, and it can be fatal if not treated properly. And if that wasn't concerning enough, staph bacteria that have developed antibiotic resistant are out there. Drug-resistant staph infections, or MRSA infections, are on the rise. MRSA, or MRSA, basically stands for Methicillin-Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It is basically a strain of staph that is no longer easily killed by antibiotics. In rare cases, MRSA can cause a potentially deadly flesh-eating disease called necrotizing fasciitis. And with a name like flesh-eating disease, it is not surprising that this is a severe and very dangerous infection that actually results in the death of parts of the body's soft tissues. I won't be adding images of this disease here because they can be quite disturbing. All right, 
So let's talk about viruses. Although bacteria are very small, viruses are much, much smaller. Viruses not only enter your body, but they enter your cells, where they take over your cells' machinery so that your cells end up making thousands of copies of the virus, eventually causing the cell to explode, releasing the newly made viruses to other cells in your body, and through coughing, sneezing, and body fluids out of your body where they can spread throughout the population. Examples of viral diseases are influenza, commonly known as the flu, COVID-19, which is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and AIDS, caused by the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. In our lesson on viruses, we will explore these three viruses and a few others in more detail. So for this lesson, I want to talk to you about a virus that you may hear about in the summertime, the hantavirus. Hantavirus is spread by infected mice. The virus is breathed in by humans when virus-containing particles that are found in the urine, droppings, or saliva from the mice are stirred into the air. When breathed in by humans, hantavirus can cause hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, a severe, sometimes fatal respiratory disease. In Canada, the majority of hantavirus pulmonary syndrome cases have occurred in the western provinces of British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And so far, none have occurred in Ontario. However, Health Canada has found the virus in a very small percentage of rodents that have been tested in northern Ontario. And although cases are rare, so much so that Canada only reports about three cases annually, the mortality rate among those infected is approximately 30% which is pretty high. And unfortunately, there are no antiviral treatments or vaccines that are currently available for this disease. The last category of pathogens I want to discuss is really unique and extremely rare. They're called prions. And prions are misfolded proteins that cause other proteins to also misfold. Prions are the cause of a rare family of progressive neurodegenerative disorders that affect both humans and animals. What this means is that they cause damage to the brain over time. Prion diseases tend to get worse over time, and unfortunately are always fatal. There are three different ways by which people can get prion diseases. Most commonly, they just occur randomly without a known cause. However, some are genetic and are due to inherited mutations in the prion protein gene. But the rarest of all prion diseases, accounting for less than 1% of cases, are acquired prions which are acquired from eating contaminated meat or are passed on from person to person, mostly from transplanted organs. The prion disease I want to talk about is called variant creutz jakob disease, or VCJD for short. This disease has been linked to eating beef contaminated with bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE, most commonly called mad cow disease. You see, an outbreak of mad cow disease occurred in the UK in the 80s and 90s. Over 4 million head of cattle had to be slaughtered in an effort to contain the outbreak. And in the 1990s, 177 people died after contracting VCJD through eating beef that had been infected with mad cow disease. It is believed that the disease outbreak happened because livestock were being fed food that had animal products in them, including brain and spinal cords from other beef. And that is because the prions that cause the disease are found in the central nervous system. So you have to eat the brain or the spinal cord to get infected. In the early stages of variant creutzfeldt jakob disease, patients often present with personality changes and psychiatric symptoms like depression. Dementia develops later as the disease progresses. Also, as the disease progresses, motor symptoms like stumbling, falling, and difficulty walking appear. The estimated incubation period for the disease from infection until the first onset of symptoms is 5 to 40 years, but the disease is fatal usually within the year from the first time the symptoms appear. And most cases of the disease have actually been in the UK. There's actually only been one person that has been diagnosed with VCJD in Canada. However, that person lived in the UK during the mad cow disease outbreak and contracted the illness while there. So when it comes to pathogens, we are considered exposed to the disease when we have been in contact with a pathogen. But just being exposed to a pathogen will not necessarily make us sick. Our immune system and many other factors play a role in whether or not exposure will lead to infection. 
Now, we are considered infected, though, when the pathogen enters our body and then causes disease. And how a pathogen enters our body can vary. We can sometimes breathe them in, but they can also enter our bodies through our eyes, our skin, through the food that we eat, the water that we drink, and also through insect and other animal bites. And again, just being exposed to a pathogen does not mean disease. To start, the human body contains many protections against pathogens, namely our immune system. And of course, social advances in medicine, food preparation, water treatment, and sanitation can help reduce the threat from pathogens. For example, proper hand washing, wearing masks, and vaccinations are helping us avoid infections of COVID-19. And so during this unit, we will explore the different pathogens and their diseases, how they're transmitted, and the different public health measures that can help us fight their spread. Talk to you soon.